Can we go ahead and work our faith tonight? Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, God is able. Ah, uh, yeah, I feel it already. Exceeding, above all. We could ask or think according to yeah, the power that. Yeah. He's gonna fulfill every promise to you now. So don't give up on God, cause He won't give it up on you. Squeeze it out, ease it out. Yeah. Yeah. If you believe it, scream it and say, He's able. He's able. Oh, oh, oh. I need everybody one time. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
It is so wonderful to see you seated there, all prim, all proper. But now you know, we bring our praise into the house of the Lord, yes? So anybody glad that you woke up this morning, that the Lord woke you up? Anybody? Anybody glad that you made your way out to the house of the Lord? Anybody? So now you can stand up on your feet if you want to. Because, you know, I was reading this screen behind me, and it said, are you ready? Are you ready for an abundant life? Are you ready for change? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you truly, truly ready? And then before that, I listened to this song, and the song just said, oh, 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 oh. yeah. Okay, so just wait for me, because now... You're not going to depend on me to sing, okay? No. It said, don't give up on God because he won't give up on you. So anybody can testify to that. It said, don't give up on God because he won't give up on you. He said, every promise he made, he is able to do. Anybody can testify to that. Yes. Don't get tired on God. So you can clap your hands. Or you can wave your hand because we have come into the house of the Lord. We're going to pray with us. We're 
brought thanksgiving with us. He brought worship with us. He brought hallelujah with us. Amen. Good morning, Bible Base. Will you bow your heads with me, please? Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, thanking you and blessing you and praising you, Lord, for your love, for your mercy, for your grace, for the abundance of blessings you continue to pour upon us. Lord, we thank you for watching over us through the night and bringing us to another day. And we thank you, Lord, for blessing us to be in the house of prayer one more time. Lord, we thank you for blessing us to know that you are God. And we thank you, Lord, for blessing us to be your saints, your servants, your sons and your daughters. Lord, and we ask you to please continue to be with us, bless us, strengthen us, guide us, cause your face to shine upon us. And help us, dear Heavenly Father, to glorify you. Lord, we ask special blessing and prayers for all that you've assigned to Bible Bay's Fellowship Church of Temple Terrace. We ask special blessing and prayers on our pastor, Pastor Earl Mason and his family. For each member, each man, each woman, each boy, each girl, each family, each individual. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us and all that you do for us. And help us, my Heavenly Father, as we go into worship this morning, that we bless you as you would have us bless you, that we praise you as you would have us praise you, that we worship you as you would have us worship you. And help us, Lord, to always bless and praise your holy name. Thank you for all you've done and all that you do. Help us always glorify you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How many of you came? How many of you came for the word of God? How many of you know that it's the word of God that will strengthen you and keep you and make you whole? Give you a reason to lift your hands and praise his name. Solidify what he's already told you make you remember God and all that he is and all that he's promised. Anybody come today just to hear the word of God? Hallelujah. If you would, turn with me to the book of Luke. Turn with me to Luke. We're going to be in chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. And I'm going to be reading from the King James Version. certainly want you to read with me. Luke chapter 10, we're starting at verses, at verse 25, and we're going to go through verse 37. You all ready to read? All right. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, read with me, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered, said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy might, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And when he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, 
and sat him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Verse 35. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, take care of him and whatsoever thou spendeth more when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinketh thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? Final verse. And he said, he that showed mercy on him, then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. The word of the Lord is blessed. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise as our praise team comes. As our praise team comes. better than that has God been good to you come on you can do better than that the Lord woke you up this morning started you on your way gave you health and a mind to come out and serve him gives you an opportunity to bless his holy name anybody love the Lord this morning anybody just glad to be in the house glad you made it through so let's give the Lord the Lord the Lord a hand up hallelujah Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Bible base, let's get ready to give God some praise. Yeah, Thank you, Lord. Thank you. You want to enter into his gates with thanksgiving yes. and into his courts with praise yes. and be thankful unto him and bless his name. Yes. For our God is good, he's excellent, he's wonderful, wonderful. and he's mighty. Yes. Come on and bless him. Your name. We bow it to you, we reverence your holy name. 
Continue to bless him. If we can just worship him a little bit, give him a sincere praise from down on the inside. We just want to sing a little bit of this old school song that says, Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul, I know. Yeah. 
is a good God. So we came to worship him, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody got a reason to bless his holy name? Come on, y'all. He's holy. He's our God. He saved us and set us free and did everything that we needed to be saved and right back into the household of praise. Let's bless his holy name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to take a moment at this time, and if you're visiting with us for the first time, would you please uh, raise your hand, at least raise your hand, raise your hand. Bless you, my dear. Thank you so much for coming to visit us at the Bible-Based Fellowship Church of Temple Terrace. We are just so grateful for your presence and thank God that you've chosen to stop by here. You go ahead and get ready for the Lord to do great things right here in and through this worship service because you came to worship him, Amen. right? All right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Welcome to bible -based. Come into the 
Hallelujah. We have this wonderful vision statement at the Bible-based Fellowship Church of Temple Terrace. We want to share that with you at this moment so that you know what the Lord is doing in and through this assembly right now. So let's get let's recite the Bible-based vision statement together. The Bible-based Fellowship Church of Temple Terrace will reach and reproduce within the Tampa Bay and Temple Terrace areas and its surrounding community. Of people inspired, equipped with compassion for the truth of Christ and his compassion for others who will be enablers of change for the discouraged, the disenfranchised, the disinherited, and the dispossessed. We are Bible-based, Christ-centered, Holy Spirit-led, Extending God's kingdom biblically, evangelistically, educationally, entrepreneurially, through expansion, economically, politically, socially, and globally. Lord, praise the Lord. This is the first Sunday in May, and this is the time that we acknowledge our May birthday. So everybody, if you have your seat, if you were born in the month of May, you remain standing. Lift your hand real high. So we can wish you a happy birthday. Amen. Happy birthday to Amen. each of you. Amen. Uh oh, y'all like Dr. Jenny go sing happy birthday. Birthday, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, happy birthday. Come on, y'all. Birthday. Happy birthday. for communion. You can take your communion out and prepare it as we get ready. We know um, that communion is for those who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And we heard wonderfully on this morning on the prayer line that we, what are we remembering? We're remembering that Christ died. What are we remembering? We're remembering why he died. And what are we remembering? We're remembering how he died. Mm. And we're supposed to come to this table with, with clear hearts. Um, it says to us in the word that if we come to the communion table and we bear it all against our brother, that we should go back and that we should make amends with our brother because we want to come to this table and we want to say that we have clean hands and we want to say that we have a pure heart. We are acknowledging Christ's passion for us. And in doing so, we used to have on the pews, but they are not there anymore, a confession of sins. And I wonder if you will pray with me. It says, Almighty and most merciful Father, we come before you acknowledging our sins and our shortcomings and our breaking of our covenant with you. Not only have we done things we ought not to have done, said things we ought not to have said, left undone so many things we ought to have done, and been silent when we should have witnessed for you. Not only are we guilty of that, O oh Lord, but we have also closed our eyes and pretended not to see the injustices, the racism, 
and the evil which pervade our everyday lives. We have shut our ears and pretended not to hear the cries for liberation which come from the lips, lives, and hearts of the oppressed, even our own black brothers and sisters. Forgive us, O Lord, renew our courage and faith, and keep us ever mindful of thy great sacrifice. Hear us, we beseech thee, as we come to you in love and worship, giving your name the praise forevermore. All right, if you have your bread, hold it up for me, please. In the book of Matthew, the 26th chapter, the 26th verse reads, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. So let us, let us eat together. Hold your wine up. It says, and he took the cup and gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remissions of sins. So let us drink together. Now, we were told this morning, if you were on our morning man line, that the, the bread that we ate and the wine that we drank, they were representatives of the memorial of Jesus Christ, of his passion for us. We know that when the scripture says when they departed their place, that they sang a hymn. But we were on the other side of resurrection and the hymn that we sing is joyful. The song that we sing says that we are, we serve a risen Savior. And he's in the world today. And he lives within us. So let us sing together. I 
you glad that you are created to worship the Lord? Well, come on, let's worship today. The psalmist says, I will bless the Lord at all times, not just in good times, not just in birthday time, not just in feeling good time, but all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make a boast in the Lord. And then you get excited and says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. For he has done wonderful things. He has done marvelous things. He has been so good. Woke me up this morning. Clothed in my right mind. Oh, you're not ready to worship. Like, you know, look, 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 I know you, you want to get a word and want to get on out of here and go home. But before I go, I just want to tell the Lord, I love him. I love him. I love you, Lord, today because you cared for me in such a special way. When nobody else loved me, looked beyond my faults, saw my needs, saw I wasn't no good, saw I was going nowhere, but he thought I was worth dying for, thought I was worth saving, thought I was worth keeping. I better hurry up and tell somebody, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I have no idea where I would be, but I got a sneaking suspicion. The psalmist said they would have swallowed me up quick. But what they thought they could do to me, Satan thought he had me. Satan thought he had me. They, Satan thought he had me. I was almost down for the count. I was sinking, come on y'all, deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. 
very deeply stained within. I was sinking to rise no more. This is our fifth week back here. This is our fifth week back here. For some of y'all, it's your fifth week, your fourth week, your first week. I put up six fingers because I've been coming here when nobody's sitting there, but I'm glad to see you. But I've come to worship the Lord. And if you don't want to praise him, that's what I'm talking about. I can't sit and look like he ain't done nothing for me. I can't act like he's done nothing for me. I've I, I, I come too far. Been through too much. People been mean to me. Been lied on. Been cheated. Been mistreated. Talked about. I am so tired of racing in and racing out. I'm going to get you out because I promise you that I would. But I'm not racing in. He deserves all I got. He deserves all I got. He deserves all I got. Y'all be sure and keep those masks on. But don't pass out. Wear your mask. Wear your mask. Wear your mask. But don't pass out. We'll be out in a moment. I want to finish having church anniversary if I can. I couldn't couldn't finish last week, so I've come back with a Luke chapter 10 here. I hope you read it. I hope you heard it. And I hope you will read it. Because this is a very familiar passage of scripture to some. It may be brand new to you. But I started talking last week about how great our church is already. But how God is calling us to make this great church greater. And we need to talk about how to do that. We're going to talk about the church on 46th Street. And you know, we, 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 we can talk about the the Jericho Road, and we will. But this text is about the church on 46th Street. That God is calling for us to present ourselves as a new you in 2022. And I'm on it. I'm on it. How about you? I, I, I'm on it. I'm on it. And, and John, or whoever wrote the book of Revelation, says he maketh all things new. And so what, what I hope that you, those of you who are note takers, I hope you will take into consideration today that the church on 46th Street, in order to be the greater church that God wants her to be, number one, that this church will respond to the needs of exploited humanity. Secondly, that in order to make this great church greater, this church on 46th Street will repair the wounds of avoided victims. I was in the barbershop this morning and uh, they had on the TV uh, uh, they, they, they were they were talking about human trafficking and they were talking about uh, how teenagers are being uh, smuggled and sold. And it just pierced me so deeply because as I was preparing for this message, uh, inside this message, I had an insertion about human trafficking. And to see the number of arrests that have been made in 2020 and 2021 of people smuggling our children, selling our children. It's no wonder that 
Bible-based fellowship church of Temple Terrace cannot remain the church she has always been. It's a great church. I go on record to say that this church is a great church. But we need to concentrate on how to make this great church greater. And one of the things I've already told you we've got to do is that we've got to respond to the needs of exploited humanity. And then secondly, we have got to repair the wounds of avoided victims. And then thirdly, my dear sister, the church on 46th Street, in order to be a greater church, to be the new church that she has to be, will reconcile, will reconcile the differences of segregated, discriminated culture. You heard it in our, our, our um, vision statement. It's always been the mantra established for us to reach and reproduce people who will have the passion for the truth of Christ and his compassion for others. Not just to reach them, but that they will be enablers of change for the discouraged, the disenfranchised, the disinherited, and the dispossessed. And having launched this passage of scripture, chapter 10, before you, the Gospel of Luke, I want us to look at this somewhat familiar story. I want to lift it out of its biblical context, which I do at times, but I will let you know that its original biblical context was intended to be interpreted for Christians individually. But what I want to do today here as we continue celebrating our church anniversary, I want to institutionalize what was intended to be individualized. What was intended to be individualized, I want to institutionalize it so that we can practice the application corporately and suggest that another aspect of this blessed church, this great church, this new you in 2022 that imitates the church, even that church on the Jericho Road. I want to take this good Samaritan, we call him, and turn his attitude and ideas into a corporate institution of the church and call his actions the church on 46th Street. I hope you'll pray with me because that's all I'm going to be talking about. This story, this story, this story was given in response to a lawyer's second question. Uh, he, he asked Jesus, he was a little, 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 little sharp shooter. Uh, this is his second question being answered. I'll tell you about the first question in a moment. But, but, but he was trying to trick Jesus. He was trying to trap Jesus. He was trying to tempt Jesus. Yeah, he, he's an expert himself in Old Testament law. He was both a lawyer and a scribe. His purpose was purely and solely to tempt Jesus or to put Jesus to test in a sense. And he no doubt hoped that Jesus would fail the test. This man and his kind, however, were jurists rather than theologians. He is the type of person common enough in scholastic circles, what we now call uh, academia, uh, who like to trap people with subtle arguments. Stay there, stay there. Don't try to read it now, it's too late. But if you catch me, I'm in verse 25 already because he asked Jesus his first question in verse 25. Did you see it? 
Jesus says, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted Jesus, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? It was expected that rabbis would discuss theological matters in public, and the question described this lawyer as was one that was often debated by the Jews. And I had to tell him it was a good question. It was a good question, but it had a bad motive because the lawyer hoped to trap the Lord. You ever seen folk like that? Try to trap the preacher, try to trap the teacher. Uh, Jesus threw the man's question back to him. He says, you supposed to know the law? What does the law say? Uh... What is written in the law? How readest thou? If something has to be done, Mr. Lawyer, to acquire eternal life, then surely the law is the place to go. So Jesus sent the man back to the law, not because the law saves us. Paul straightens that out early in Galatians chapters 2 and 3, but because the law is a school teacher, the law is a schoolmaster, the law was to teach us or show us or lead us in such a way to show us that we need to be saved, there can be no real conversion without conviction. And the law is what God uses to convict sinners. The lawyer, being smooth tongued, tossed two key passages from the Mosaic legislation back to Jesus. Listen at what he said. You know what the law say, Rabbi. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. He borrows that from Leviticus 19 and Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5. Listen at it again because you didn't catch it. He wanted to know what the law has to say about doing. So in the EBM rendering, you would read it like this. Thou shalt do this. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. And do this with all thy soul. And do this with all thy strength. And do this with all thy mind. And do this, thy neighbor, as thyself. Jesus gave the man's do right back to him. This do. And thou shalt live, he said. Verse 28. There, y'all, we have the gospel of good works, the theology of the man who says, I'm doing the best I can. I'm doing the best I can to make it in. I'm doing the best I can. The Lord overlooked the flaw in this clever lawyer's original question, what shall I do to inherit? Because, you know, usually an inheritance is received, not earned. In any case, we cannot do anything to gain eternal life for the simple reason that we are incapable of doing anything good enough for God. We are incapable of doing good enough for God. You don't have to take my road. We're jotted down. Paul said it like this in Romans chapter 3, verses 9, 10. Well, you read it because you're not going to take my word. Read Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 20. Think away that you're on my mind. The two passages that the lawyer quoted prove man's incompetence to produce anything good enough for God. Why come that? Because nobody but Jesus ever loved God with all his heart. 
Nobody but Jesus ever loved God with all his mind. Nobody but Jesus ever loved God with all his soul. Nobody but Jesus ever loved God with all his strength. No one but Jesus ever loved his neighbor as himself. Nobody has ever done the best he could. People who imagine that works is the way to heaven, they stand condemned by their own religion. The first question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 28. The further question, Luke chapter 10, verse 29 through 37. By this time, the lawyer was no doubt beginning to wish that he had never tried to trap Jesus. He tried to confuse the issue. Willing to justify himself, something most people try to do when they are driven into a corner. So the lawyer asked another question. Who is my neighbor? Rather than answer the lawyer's pettifogging, uh, small and insignificant arguing question, the Lord told him this story and uh, you theologues may say that this is a parable. I don't know, Carla, if it's a parable or not, because Jesus didn't say it was a parable. I'll be back to that in a minute because, you know, I'm always handing you something on a silver platter. and You don't know whether to take it or not. Jesus tells the man this story. I believe that this was a true story. I believe that this account could really have happened. I'll tell you why. Listen to it. This is the way Jesus told it. Forcing the man to answer a much more pointed question. Am I a neighbor? Notice, notice, notice the scribe gave the right answer, but he would not apply it personally to himself and admit his own lack of love for both God and his neighbor. So instead of being justified by throwing himself on the mercy of God, he tried to justify himself and wiggle out of his predicament. He used that old debating tactic, another legal approach. Define your terms. What, what does it mean, neighbor? What, what, what does neighbor mean? What do you mean by neighbor, Jesus? Who, who, who is my neighbor? So he raised this, I'm going to use Dr. Jenny's word, this incredible, provocative question, trying again to trick Jesus. Who is my neighbor? The reason why he asked this question is because he was losing the argument hands down and he wanted to shift the focus. He had started out talking about eternal life. Now he shifts the focus over to who is my neighbor. See, in those days, the religious leaders spent a lot of time drawing lines, drawing lines, drawing lines, like DeSantis is trying to draw lines over here over here to make sure that over here you don't have you have, you're in, uh, drawing lines. It's, a, it's not a new thing. You got to read your Bible. They had a, they spent a lot of time drawing lines because they were more interested in limiting their neighborliness than they were in loving or defining their neighborliness. So they drew lines of distinction the rabbis, the Pharisees, the Essenes, the Zealots, the, the, the Jewish culture, they split hairs over this question and excluded from neighbor Gentiles and especially, oh my goodness, those half-breeds called Samaritans. I can tell y'all heard this story before and you're wondering when I'm going to tell you about the church on 46th Street. I'm doing it right now. Because there is lines being drawn as we are sitting in church right now. 
The lawyer wanted to discuss neighbor in a general way, but Jesus forced him to consider a specific man in need. How easy it is for us to talk about abstracts and abstract ideas and fail to help solve concrete problems. We can discuss things like poverty. We can discuss things like rent hikes. We can discuss things like job opportunities. We can discuss, 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 and yet never personally help a hungry family or help somebody apply for the R3 program or the Our Florida program. Y'all don't even know what that is. I'm going to tell you what it is. It's the answer to people who are behind in their rents and their mortgages and the government says, I want to hand you over this money. I want to pay up to five months of your mortgages or your rents. All you got to do to do the paperwork. I know some people who have got them people money and throw their money away. Now they broke both ways. Of course, the, the, the lawyer, the lawyer, the lawyer here wanted to make the issue somewhat complex and philosophical, but Jesus made it simple and practical. He moved it from duty to love. He moved it from debating to doing. To be sure, our Lord was not condemning discussions or debates. He was only warning us not to use these things as excuses for doing nothing. Committees are not always committed, you know. This story that Jesus told this lawyer, a man whom Jesus loved with all his heart, this story is in three parts. The first part of the story is about ruin. Listen to it. A man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. A man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now you silent, you silent, you need to know something about Jerusalem. And you need to know something about Jericho. And a cursed place. The city of God. It is. A man went down from a, the city of God to an accursed place. He fell among thieves. Thieves who stripped him. Thieves who wounded him. Thieves who left him half dead. Y'all are going to get this because it ain't like it used to be. I can't preach all Sunday morning <laughs> into the lunch hour. <laughs> You're going to get this. Uh, a man, Jesus tells the lawyer this story. A man went, no, he fell down. Now, I happen to have been on this street. I've been on the, the, the Jericho Road. I, I literally, physically have been on the Jericho Road. And it is scary. I, I'm serious. It's scary. <laughs> It's scary where it is. It's scary how it is. It's scary because you already know that it's easy for people to come out and grab you, beat you up, leave you there. Now, strangely enough, when we were there, tourists, you know how we are. We want to take a picture of everything. We want to go with it to a guy, tell you don't go. We want to do things. <laughs> Not me, baby. <laughs> I stayed closest to the tour guide as I could. You say, don't do that? Okay. But you can see things on that road if it's right there by you, but somebody can come up behind you because people all look about the same. They're going and coming. They're going and coming. They're going and coming. They're going and coming. And Jesus is telling the story about them going and coming, going and coming. He says that while one man was going, he says somebody else was there called thieves. Thieves who beat you up. Thieves. Thieves who rob you. Thieves. Thieves who beat you up so bad they leave you for dead. Uh, he fell among thieves who stripped him, wounded him, and left him half dead. It is a picture of fallen man that when a person has turned his back 
on the city of God, Jerusalem, for a city, a cursed Jericho. You remember Joshua fought the battle at Jericho. Oh, I tell you, the only way he can go is down when you leave God's house you leave God's place. The only place you can go is down. The way down was also dangerous. Perils lurked everywhere as the traveler soon found out. And so it's not only a story of ruin. Secondly, it is also a story of rejection. The poor fallen man had no help. He had no one to help him, and he certainly could not help himself. He might well have expected help from the two people who came by. They, however, acted terribly. They wanted nothing to do with him. You know any people like that? Two other men. Both of the men who showed up at this man's great point of need who represented organized religion. Church we used to be cannot be the church we're going to be. The man who was in such desperate need realized that he could do nothing for himself. All of the doing must be done by someone else. How about that, Mr. Lawyer? Jesus did not say that this story was a parable, so I don't either. It could well be the report of an actual occurrence. Challenge the teacher. For Jesus to tell a story that made the Jews look bad and the Samaritans look good, that's why I come to this conclusion. For Jesus to do that and he himself is a Jew, that would either be dangerous or self-defeating. You just made that up, Jesus. That's what they could say. We all know that nothing like that would ever happen around here, Jesus. So it is possible that some of his listeners, including Mr. Lawyer Man, knew that such a thing had really happened. Either way, <laughs> the account is realistic. One thing I know about parables, and that is that the worst thing we can do with any parable, if it's a parable, especially if this is one, is to turn it over and make everything stand for something. You know how we do the, uh, what's that little boy name? The, the prodigal son. The whole family were prodigals. Prodigal father, the prodigal older brother, the prodigal little boy, the prodigal who left home, the prodigal who stayed home, and the prodigal who went out there and threw the party for the prodigal. Oh, let's figure out what prodigal means. What definition of prodigal? Who is my neighbor? I've heard this taught so many different ways. They say the good Samaritan is Jesus who saves the man, pays his bill, promises to come again. The, 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 the Motel 6 or the Holiday Inn, I don't remember which one it was. Y'all remember which one? Where they took him? Renaissance? Okay, so where he, he took him, he, he stayed there overnight with him. They say that the inn stands for the local church where believers are cared for and the two pence are the two ordinances, baptism and communion. There's a whole lot of stuff out there that's being taught everywhere. Some say the two pence represents the time in which Jesus would be gone. What I'm trying to show you in this quick haste is, is if you take this approach to scripture, especially parables, you can make the Bible say almost anything you please, and you are sure to miss the messages God wants you to get. The Samaritan is one who sees the need of another and having the resources to meet it does so without prejudice and regardless of circumstances. This is, in one sense, the Christian way of life. What Jesus did is he took 
the lawyer's question and turned it into an opportunity to teach an eternal and invaluable lesson. It is a sermon in a sentence. Your relationship with God must dictate your relationship with your fellow man. I'll say it as loud as I can without bursting your ears is what you think about God ought to dictate what you think about everything else. Your relationship with God ought to speak volumes about how you treat your fellow man. Your, your relationship with God ought to make a difference. And I'll pause and ask you the question, what difference does it make that God would choose you to use you and you sit? Your relationship with God cannot be separated from your relationship with your fellow man. I don't care if they're gay, straight, lesbians, transvestites, white, black, tall, short, skinny, short, fat, ugly, fine, no way, ooh, not that one, educated or not. That's the sermon in a sentence. My relationship with God must dictate my relationship with my fellow man. My relationship with God cannot be separated from my relationship with my fellow man. Now, if you take that and enlarge it and look at it for a bigger picture for the institution of the church on 46th Street, what I'm trying to say to you is that the church cannot separate her relationship with Christ from her responsibility to this community. It's not enough to come up in here and sing and pick a seat and, and, and choose a seat and want a seat and don't want to sit in another seat. And if anybody's in the annex, thank y'all for sitting over there. Thank y'all. We appreciate you. We love you just as much as we love these over here in the sanctuary. And those of you who are out on the internet, God bless you with that you're not coming back yet. But when you come back, you may find things very different. It's not enough to come up in here and sing and shout and have sermons. It's not enough to come up in here and praise God and pray to God and preach about God because when you really worship God, not only does it make a difference in your life, it ought to make a difference in your life towards your fellow man. It ought to make a difference in your life. It ought to make a difference everywhere you turn, everywhere you go. It ought to make a difference in the community. How different is this community because this church is on 46th Street? If you are not silent in church, then you ought not be silent in the community. If you really worship God, Isaiah said it, I didn't. Isaiah said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. He says, that thing took a hold of me. He says, I said, woe is me. I'm in bad shape. He says, and I hang around with folk that's in bad shape. A man of unclean, with unclean lips. You got to look at you when you are trying to be a new you in 2022. You got to look at yourself when you see God in worship and you have to change. I'm just like this. I'm going to be like this. I've been like this. and I ain't You have to look at you. Isaiah said, my lips are unclean. Oh, when I look at my community, they are unclean also. Woe is me and woe is my community. I got to do something about me so I can do something about the community. And so the first thing I wanted to emphasize here is that in order to make a great church greater, the church on 46th Street must respond to the needs of exploited humanity. God blesses people who pay attention to human needs. Uh, the church on 46th Street must respond to the needs of exploited humanity. And I go on record to repeat something I've said every year since we've been Bible-based Fellowship Church of Temple Terrace. We have an awesome opportunity. We have an awesome privilege that's been afforded us to continue to be a vibrant church, a great church, but to even be now a greater church. During this 21st century, God has entrusted us to be his partners at this pivotal juncture. 
his will being done on earth as it is in heaven as we pursue all things new in 2022, what the church will look like and how it will perform in the next year or so greatly depends on how you and I allow God to use us. Mountain challenges in the form of rapid social, technological, economic, and environmental changes places great demands on the church. Add to these swift decline in moral consciousness and the rise of unbiblical belief systems and practices and the picture becomes clearer. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ cannot afford to continue with business as usual. We must be driven by authentic vision from God through the kingdom's agenda and that's how we'll accomplish it. Look at verse 30. I would read it, but time is gone. And look at verse 31 and 32 and 33 and 34 and 35. That's what I have to do now because I got to get you home to do nothing. In verse 36 and verse 37, I got to get you there. And so listen, Jesus says in verses 30 through, through, through 37 that there was a man traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho on the Jericho road and he was am ambushed by a brigade or a band of thieves and they brutally beat him. They stripped him of his goods, tore his clothes off and they left him raggedy and naked there to finish dying by the side of the road. Oh, the road from Jericho, the road from Jerusalem down to Jericho. I'll tell you, I'm going to say it because it'll make you tremble. It was dangerous out there. And since the temple workers used it so much, you would have thought the Jews or Romans would have taken steps to make it safer. But they got soldiers everywhere checking you. They got police everywhere checking you. It is much easier to maintain a religious system than it is to improve the neighborhood. And to improve the quality of life for the least, the lost, the left out, the looked over, and the unlucky. I can't let 31 stay out there by itself. Listen, and by chance, there came down a certain priest, the preacher, the pastor, came by chance. He came by chance. And when he saw that man beat up, robbed, raggedy and left for dead bible says the preacher passed by on the other side verse 32 and likewise deacon white i mean a, a levite when he was at the place came and looked on it and passed by on the other side Y'all missed it. Along came a priest. He was surely the man the wounded wayfarer needed. He looked at him and dawning with dawning hope in vain. The priest saw him. Passed by on the other side. So much for the priest, the man who stood for the rituals of the law. And there were many of them. This shoddy, shallow priest knew all about the sacrifices, all about the feast days, all about the fast days, and all about circumcision, and all about Sabbath. A lot of help this priest, this priest did. He was about the rites of religion, however rooted in truth and tradition, which cannot help a half-dead lost soul. What good would it have done for Jesus to have told the dying thief that he needed to be baptized? Then came I mean, a Levite, a man who, just like Pastor Mason, I mean the priest, was consecrated to God. Likely enough, the lawyer who had challenged Jesus was a Levite. The Levite's great duty was to preserve the law of God from any form of dilution or attack and to see that its requirements were kept, its precepts were properly administered, and it was passed on intact to posterity. In short, the Levite was concerned not 
so much with the rights of religion, but with the rules of religion, what good would it have done to tell this poor broken man to recite the Ten Commandments or even just the two commandments that the lawyer had recited to Jesus? In any case, the Levite was no help. He crossed the road and took a look at this man, and then he, he, he did just like Reb, uh, left him in his misery, concerned about the rights of religion. Concerned about the rules of religion. Both of them passed by. Left the man in the same shape he was in. Between the priest and Levite. Oh, it demonstrated the failure of rules and rights in organized religion to save us. They passed by. Now when you research, when you research that Jericho Road, you'll discover that it was only 20 miles long. But I want to suggest to you today as I race to my close that its modern counterparts are longer than 20 miles. If the truth be told, they stretch around the whole world. The modern Jericho Road goes through Tampa, goes through New Tampa, goes through Avala, goes through the modern Jericho Road, goes through Temple Terrace. The modern Jericho Road goes to wherever city you are in, those of you who are viewing us. The, the, the modern Jericho Road goes through your neighborhood. No, the modern Jericho Road goes through your address, through your living room closer than you think. It's in your house. It passes through each of your rooms. You cannot avoid the Jericho Road. And just like its ancient counterpart, the modern day Jericho Road is full of thieves, full of robbers, full of mean people. Full of people who bully you, full of people who beat you, full of people who bruise you, full of people, people who will rob you, crimes and violence, drugs and alcohol, sexual promiscuity and physical abuse. The modern Jericho Road, you need to understand that not all of the Jericho Road thieves and robbers are dead. People are being abused and exploited every single day. Racism, classism, casteism, sexism, human rights, civil rights, voting rights, living wage, discouraged, disenfranchised, disinherited, dispossessed every single day. You know what the critical question then is? What is the great church going to do to be greater? What is the church going to do about the issues and, the, and what answers will it bring if they're, they're on 46th Street and we're the only church now on the 46th Street Jericho Road? What are we going to do about it? The church on 46th Street will respond to the needs of exploited humanity. Because we understand that God blesses people who pay attention to human needs. I know that the church got to hunk it off. We did not beat up those folk. We did not rob them of their rent. We did not rob them of their mortgage money. We did not strip those folk of their housing, their possessions, their rights, not civil rights, not human rights, not their voting rights, not their living rights. We didn't strip them of their working rights. We, 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 we did not pimp them nor get them pregnant and then leave them on the side of the road. We did not refuse to parent them properly nor disciple them, abuse them, and, and discipline them and leave them on the side of the road half dead. We did not do that. We did not put them in jails and prisons and penitentiaries and all of the other places that shackle them. Wake up to social justice, Bible base. We did not undereducate them or underemploy them. We did not underpay them and then leave them on the side of the road half dead. But there is a line in the Bible that says, what are ye above the others? What have you done that's better than what the thieves have done? Because you need to know that to do nothing is as much a sin. To remain silent, removed from not to do good, is as much sin as doing bad. 
silence is golden. Somebody has ably said all evil need to do to win is for good people to do nothing. And I'm not so sure that we don't have some of those Jericho thieves around town here. I'm just not so sure. See, when they saw that man coming down the road, they did not see him as a human being. They did not see him as a creature made in the Imago Day, the image of God. They did not see him as some mother's child. They did not see him as some child's father. They did not see him as a husband of some wife. They did not see him as some significant contributor to society. They saw Medgar. They saw Trayvon. They saw Breonna Taylor. Police have killed over 1,500 African Americans since Michael Brown. Uh, uh, they didn't see no human being. They saw him as an opportunity to exploit. And there are some people even in these churches who all week long spend time exploiting folk, taking advantage of the disadvantaged folk, the elderly, the mentally challenged. It's not enough to sit in here and fan and be cool and be cushioned and, and clap your hands if you want to, but it's not enough to sit in here and look holy, to have grace holy habits, and then be unhel unhelpful. And so, number one, the church on the 46th Street will respond to the needs of exploited humanity. Number two, we will repair the wounds of avoided victims. Why should such a great church become greater? Because God's name is at stake. We have to get involved because God's reputation is on the line. Somebody who is on the side of the road half dead, they're waiting for God to move, to touch, to heal to deliver. They're waiting for somebody to come by and tell them that God sits high and look low and feels and sees and cares. They're waiting for somebody to tell them to cast all their cares upon him for he cared for them. They're waiting for somebody to come tell them that God loves them and so do I. They're waiting for somebody to come and tell them and my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Somebody left on the side of the road, oh, on the other side, exploited and avoided in need. Those two professionals, the priest and the Levite, they looked, but they avoided the man. I ain't got no watch on. Can I tell y'all something? I'm going to tell you anyway. Sometimes it is more painful to be ignored or avoided than it is to be exploited. When you exploit me, you have to first identify me as somebody to be exploited. You have to at least grant me a sense of somebodyness to do evil under me. But when you avoid me or you ignore me, you say that I don't exist. You say there's nothing relevant about me. You say I'm not a human being. To ignore me on, uh, 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 on my side of town, you ignore my neighborhood, you draw a line. All those digs and issues that are relevant to minorities, you say doesn't matter. You're not even saying I'm a fifth of a man. You're saying I'm no man talking about we are living in a post-racial era. Fooey for you, and there is no more racism. Fooey for you. Listen, because I got a lot to say right here. There are so many Christians who act every day just like the priest, just like the Levite. Can you imagine you, 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 can you imagine you avoiding Ignoring, neglecting, overlooking, passing by. 
I like to keep my glasses on because they don't let the camera see my bags. I got, well, shopping carts. There's some things grow up under there when you don't get enough sleep. But can you imagine? <laughs> Boy, you're going to be great when you learn how to admit your flaws. You're going to be all right. You're going to be all right when you learn how to be free enough to don't look like the, the decorated one. Ooh. It's newsflash. God chose me just like I'm yours. Look, can, you, can I keep it, Fifi? Can I keep it real here? Has your religion made you too good for this world? Are you so heavenly minded until you are no earthly good? Most of us can think up excuses for the priest and Levite as they ignored the victim. Maybe when, maybe we have used them ourselves. The priest had been serving God at the temple all week and was anxious to go home. Perhaps the bandits were still lurking in the vicinity and using the victim as bait. Why take a chance? Anyway, it was not his fault that the man was attacked. The road was busy. So somebody else was bound to come along and help the man. The priest left it to the Levite. I know, I know Deke coming. And then Deke, the Levite, did what the priest did. Nothing. 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 Such is the power of the bad example of a religious man. I think Jesus must have seen two levels of carelessness in those fellas. The priest, he just barely looked over at the man. He saw him, but he didn't go assist him in any way. He just looked at him and left him like he saw him. Went on about his business. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm going to start next week at 730. So I can get y'all out by this thing now the first half an hour by myself. Keep this thought. This is a great church. But God is challenging us to be greater. Next week, the Lord says the same. I'm going to give you the hard, cold facts of what we are going to do. To be the different church, the greater church. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Perhaps, Lord, we'll have to listen to it again and again to get more of it but we heard you we must speak truth to power we heard you we must evidence our relationship with you in the community because we understand that the plight of this community is, in, is inextricably tied to those of us who are in relationship with you. We want your name to be hallowed. And so we must be a greater church. We want your kingdom to be realized. And so we must make our relationship with you impact the community. We want your will to be done. Even now, Lord, in this moment of reflection, we ask 
that you would allow your spirit to convict the sinner, to convince the sinner, to comfort the sinner, convict the sinner of his state, convince the sinner of their need for you to be their savior, and comfort them that you might convert them to be in your family. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, this would be the moment that it'll revolutionize everything else that you will ever have to deal with. If you're not a Christian, would you just stand where you are? I'm not going to ask you to do nothing, but stand for the moment. Preacher, I'm not a sinner. I might be a sinner. Preacher, I am a sinner. If you're not sure, stand. Preacher, I might be saved and I might not. If that sounds like you, just stand. I want to have a word of prayer with you. I'm not going to eat you. I'm not going to bite you. I'm not going to do anything with you. I'm not going to come shouting over you and saying something you don't understand and I don't either. Preacher, no, I'm not saved. I'm not a Christian. I've never accepted Jesus Christ. Stand. I want to have a word of prayer with you. I promise you every word I'll say to you, it'll be in English. Preacher, I am saved, and I'm sure about that. But I sense the Lord is leading me to join, unite with this church, be a part of this church. I want to join today. I want to be a part of this church. If that's you, I want you to stand wherever you are. Stand wherever you are. Those of you who are in the uh, overflow, if you're there, there are some persons responsible for assisting us in this moment. They'll, they'll help you. They'll guide you. Those of you who are viewing us on the internet, the phone number that you read, the email addresses that you read, they will certainly bring you a response and a responsible person on the other end. I bless you. I don't see any standing or raising. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, diligence and your faith. God is going to do uh, a, a, a new thing in this community, and he's going to do it through those of us who will be challenged to stop avoiding the pain in the community. I bless you. The church on 46th Street, you can give the Lord a better hand clap of praise than that. That's the promise of where we are and where we're going. We do bless the Lord today for his word, and we are thankful to God that what we're praying is that we're not just hearers of his word, but that we're doers also. And so we thank the Lord for our pastor. Let's bless the Lord for what the Lord is doing in and through him. 24 years of this church being in existence, 24 years with the same leader. Listen, y'all, that is a blessing from the Lord. Thank you. We're getting ready to leave this place. We hope that you have already, those of you in the sanctuary, already prepared your offering. You'll be able to um, make your um, offering as you exit out of the sanctuary. Those in the overflow, you still also can give um, in the sanctuary as well. Um, those of you online, please check out our online opportunities to give through PayPal on our website and also through Givelify. So please don't be remiss. Check that out and go ahead and make your offering unto the Lord in those manners. 
We do thank you if you're visiting with us for the first time. We're so glad to see you here. And we know that you chose right. So thank you. Thank you for being here. To all of our Bible-based Fellowship Church of Temple Terrorist members, it's so good to see your faces and so good to be in the place together. Please don't forget, um, we sent out a text on last Sunday. I will send it again today. For those of you who have family members or loved ones that have um, transitioned from this life during this period, pandemic time, please, we do want you to complete that information so that we have right spelling and everyone's name. I'll send that out to you again today. If you do not get it or have any trouble, please call the church office tomorrow morning. One more time. Have you been blessed by the word of God today? Hallelujah. We're getting ready to leave this place. Let us pray. Most gracious God, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for all that you are and all that you're doing in, in each of us. Thank you, Lord, for us as a family, us as a community. Thank you for reminding us that you've, er you've already made us great, but you're on the move to make us greater as a church, Lord, your church, where you, your presence reign. And we thank you. We love you. We magnify you. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Now you all can stand and get instructions from the usher. You may stand, please stand, on the outsides, I'm sorry, stand, and you'll get instructions from the usher. If you would, if you're on the outside, I'll face the wall and starting from the front, come 